Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for setting the tone of our discussion and opening our webinar. Now, before we start our discussion, I would like to invite everyone to put their camera on and let's take a quick photo session together. Okay, I start seeing the faces of everyone. Let's give a few more seconds. Okay, I think we're ready. I'm gonna count from one to three and then we're gonna take the picture. One, two, three. One more time, just for backup. One, two, three. Thank you very much, everyone. Let's start our discussion now. I think we're also ready for live streaming on YouTube. So you might wanna say hi for the students that are watching us from YouTube. Um, now, um, now we're all excited to hear from our speakers and start our discussion. Uh, for the audience, please type your questions in the chat box. And for our YouTube audience, please type your question in the comment section and we will discuss them at the end of the session. Please also include to whom you're gonna address your question to. Let me now welcome Ms. Manizeh Bano, Executive Director of Sahil Pakistan, who will share with us Sahil's local initiatives and experience in Pakistan in advocating for girls' empowerment through global citizenship education and life skills. Manizeh, over to you. Thank you, Heidi. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, I'm honored to be here today to be able to share with you a little bit about Sahil and our work and our association with Aflatone. So um, Sahil has worked for child protection, especially against child sexual abuse and wants every child to be safe, secure and protected. Uh, we have been in the field for 25 years against all odds when we began, and we are now registered with every possible agency that is required for us to work. Uh, we have five Sahel offices across Pakistan, and therefore we are a national organization. Our most important uh, work is our annual research publication called Cruel Numbers, where we do a statistical, a statistical analysis of all cases of child sexual abuse that are reported in the newspapers. And this is perhaps the only um, uh, statistics available across Pakistan and is quoted even in the courts, which brings us to our free legal aid services, which we link up by uh, uh, sending offer letters to every single uh, case that is uh, report, reported and offer them free legal aid and counseling services, which are in our offices also. This was our first major program when we began. It was teacher training programs in both secondary, primary and secondary schools. And we reached out to 30, more than 35,000 teachers across 44 cities. These are the messages we developed for protection, which has, we put on air and has reached out to more than 900,000 children across Pakistan. The awareness in communities was uh, had reached out to 1.1 million adults on all the six most important aspects of child protection. These are some awards that we were given. Now our Aflatoon Sahil Partnership, which began in 2007, where we were the first uh, attended the first ma training of master trainers, and then became partners. And we implemented their program then in the juvenile, uh, with the juveniles in Adyala Jail, Rawalpindi, with more than 160 juveniles, and then went on to trainings. But the other big thing we did was we made an interactive CD game of all the elements of, uh, you know, of the Aflatoon curriculum, adding environment which at that time had not become a part of it. I think what I really want to say is that the reason we could do all this work was because Aflatoon has always been extremely culturally uh, appropriate, giving you all the options and extremely flexible in the way it brings the program to you. 
and that may, still keeps all the core values in place. This is a very big strength of Aflatoon programs. And we did the Aflatoon uh, plus contextualization in 19, and then we did a free day training for 12 nonprofit organizations in Islamabad, and then we conducted a training of trainers for the Aflatoon partner in Hyderabad. Rota Aflatoon Sahil Partnership. Today, Sahil is an implementing partner for the program in Sindh and Jafrabad. We are most grateful to the education departments of both the provinces for their tremendous support and availability of uh, providing the teachers for the training. Uh, we are very pleased to announce that the training is ongoing. One, our first teacher training is ongoing and they, I hope, have got attached to the webinar because we wanted them to also know the, about the international program. Uh, we expecting these outcomes, 150 teachers, 34 government schools. It is introducing an extremely interactive teaching methodology. Teachers will replicate with 12,000 students. Entrepreneurship will be developed through 69 student clubs. And we will link up the clubs with government and local initiatives. I think this program is going to be highly beneficial for youth empowerment. They will understand the value of teamwork, of gender sensitivity, and of financial inputs. Sahil really recommends the inclusion of this program in all schools. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manize. Excellent presentation. I already see questions flying in on YouTube to Manize, but we're going to discuss them later. Now we would like to hear from Ms. Rosi Sakya, who will share her experience uh, from Samunat Nepal on local initiatives in Nepal and to give us even deeper insights on the landscape where our projects is implemented. Rosi, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yari. Hello and namaste everyone. Today, uh, let me share my screen. Today, I would like to take you on a ride down the various programs run by Samunat Nepal. So we are a national NGO established some 10 years ago. We work with supporting the sustainable development goal for and quality education. Our mission is to advocate at the policy level to create an equitable quality learning society through evidence-based strategies, integrated approaches, and capacity building. Our goal is in short support to the government in implementing the policy for equitable quality learning environment for all children and adolescents in the nation. To do this, we have three pronged objectives, which are to demonstrate innovative solutions to research and evaluation. We have designed innovative programs that address the needs of out of school children and adolescents, especially focusing on girls and marginalized castes and communities like the Dalits, Mushahars, Tepangs, et cetera. We have conducted assessment of learners to measure their learning levels. We have also conducted gap analysis of the primary and secondary curriculum according to the global learning domains framework. We've designed and developed various non-formal education packages, resource materials, IEC materials, training modules and manuals on a wide array of educational topics. Our second objective is to build capacity of partners and key stakeholders regards child-friendly teaching and learning pedagogy, child protection, comprehensive sexuality education, nutrition and education, school-based disaster risk reduction, etc., to name a few, so that they are able to implement the projects more effectively. We also conduct workshops, orientations, planning meetings with government and related stakeholders on girl empowerment, gender and social inclusion, inclusive governance, child protection, sector. A third objective is to advocate and promote partnership. We have partnered with several local governments to have shared ownership and several CSOs and community learning centers so that they're able to effectively deliver the results of the program. How do we do this? We, we are led by a board constituting of seven members and chaired by Dr. Suman Kamal Puladar, who was education specialist at UNICEF and she has over 20 years of working experience working on education policy. We also have an advisory team constituting of three professional people that provide guidance and support. And we also have a dynamic central and team level staffs. 
our major focus uh, is on alternative learning programs in the past. And our focus has been on the learning needs of the out of school children and adolescents from marginalized communities, where over 62% of the beneficiaries have been girls, Dalits, and marginalized caste. The KSP or Flexible Learning Center, also called Kildit Sikni Kendra in the local language, is a flexible learning center that is catered to over 3,200 beneficiaries working in a partnership with five municipalities. The ALP program is the government program in equity led districts where we supported with training and providing material support to over 3,000 beneficiaries. In the past, we worked in the urban out of school children program by developing learning packages and learning assessment, as well as providing training to facilitators. The back to school program caters to mainstreaming poor adolescent girls and boys in school by providing mentoring and school support materials in two districts, reaching 250 children last year. During the COVID times, after it was loosened, the facilitators used home-based learning as a measure to continue support learning in times of crisis, while the local municipality provided the measures to remain safe. Our major focus of these programs have been on girl empowerment and learning continuity as well as support. Our next group of programs focus on quality education in schools. This comprises of the NASA assessment of learners, that that's the National Assessment of Student Achievement, where Samunath was involved in the assessment of 1,800 schools in 75 districts. We also have done performance audit of schools on uh, schools in selected schools in two districts. Uh, similarly, we have developed materials on nutrition education to deliver key messages on nutrition in schools. We have a program uh, that is working in partnership with the municipality on 53 schools to implement a child-centered local subjects. Our next set of programs focus on adolescent peer education for youth empowerment. We implemented the child social and financial education program in 17 schools in five districts of Nepal, reaching out to over 2194 children and integrated the CSFP components in the national curriculum. We carried out the integration of comprehensive sexuality education and gender-based violence in the non-formal education package and provided training to facilitators. We also have developed life skills materials and training as well as packages on parenting education and materials development. Similarly, we are carrying out gender sensitive global citizenship and life skills education in 100 schools and 40 non-formal centers, reaching out to over 12,000 youth from Karnali province and province two youth, reaching out and uh, partnering with six municipalities and six CSOs to strengthen local initiatives. These are a glimpse of our training uh, materials, developing the training, a workshop with the government, IC materials, game sets. We work at the federal level with the MOESPC HRD, Curriculum Development Center, Education Review Office, at the local level with the municipalities, boards, and community learning centers and CSOs. We have been working with UN agencies like UNICEF, UNESCO, and UNDP. Various INGOs we've been partnering and working. We've been working with various NGOs and CBOs at the community level and community learning centers, as well as local communities. Lastly, I'd like to thank you and namaste for your attention and time. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, your presentation really gives us uh, the insights about the needs for social and financial education and all the great work you're doing in Nepal. Before we deep dive into the discussion, let's hear from uh, Mr. Roland Munash, CEO of Af Aflatun International, um, to share with us his experience in delivering financial and social educations to adolescents. Roland, over to you. Thank you, Yari. Um, it's a pleasure and honor to be with you today. Um, let me start to thank reach out to Asia for their leadership in this important initiative. The, the, the presentations we just heard from Ms. Maniza Bano uh, from Pakistan and Rosie Shakia uh, from Nepal highlight again the importance of girls' empowerment. Fortunately, there is a growing recognition of the importance of girls' empowerment uh, and the need to, do, to introduce global citizenship education in schools to empower adolescent boys and girls. As adolescents transition from childhood to adulthood, and at the same time from school to work life, they need tools to adapt in a positive way to the changes in their lives. 
They need tools so that they can thrive and make useful contributions to their families, communities, and economies. And therefore, global citizenship education is so important. Uh, at Aflatoon, we believe it is an essential component of ed any education uh, system. And, and uh, talking about Aflatoon, a few words on the effectiveness of, of uh, programs to empower adolescent girls and boys. And, and at Aflatoon, we've been focusing in, in recent years a lot on research, monitoring, and evaluation. And we've done that for two purposes. First of all, there has always been a sort of mainstream education sector about suspicion. We need to focus on numeracy and literacy, not on these other concepts. And we wanted to document the importance of global citizenship education for every boy and girl. Uh, and therefore, we have been building the evidence uh, to show the positive impact which uh, social financial education can have on the lives of children and their families. We also have done a lot of research to improve the program delivery, to make sure that the, the programs are top notch uh, as we deliver them on, on the ground. And in recent years, uh, our Aflatoon partners have done over 100 studies. And just this year, we released three randomized control trials uh, from India, Cameroon, and Burkina Faso. The different st studies are clearly showing that adolescent girls who attend social and financial education programs have an improved positive self-esteem, they show more empathy, they are more critical thinkers, they are more aware of their child rights, um, they are more actively participating in the communities, and children who go through the program are more financially literate. They are more likely to save, and they save larger amounts, and they also show more active entrepreneurial attitudes. So these programs work and they're important. This is not only a finding from Aflatoon and, and for the people who are attending today, but there is a growing international body of academic literature research recently published in, in, the, in the different uh, academic journals showing how important it is to empower adolescent girls, these essential skills. And there are two key findings coming out of the research again and again. First of all, and that was also men, uh, mentioned uh, by the two previous speakers, is to have successful programs, you really need to be, they need to be locally owned and they may, need to be locally contextualized. And therefore we at Aflatoon think it's important that local partners and governments have to be in the driving seat as we contextualize uh, the programs uh, to the specific settings. The second finding, aside from local contextualization and locally owned programs, is the importance of building the capacity of teachers. I understand that a number of people who have just been trained in the Aflatoon methodology are attending this webinar, and I'm happy to congratulate you with your new uh, skills. Research is showing again and again that it is really essential to build the capacity of educators, the teachers, and, and give them really the top-notch skills. At Aflatoon, we are using an active learning methodology. It's a child-centered approach, and that is really a core component of these programs. So whenever you do global citizenship education, please make sure that you build the capacity uh, of the teachers as they grow with uh, work with the, ch the children. As I'm coming to the end of my short intervention, two, two key and important points I would like to reiterate. Um, and, and that's why this uh, webinar today is so important. The importance of sharing experiences. We are learning every day and it is so important that in so many different countries, so many important global citizenship educations are happening that we share with each other because we can continuously improve uh, our programs. And, and therefore, again, thank you for organizing this webinar. The second point is all girls in the world need these types of skills. Global citizenship uh, education is essential. And therefore it's also essential to work with governments to integrate global citizenship education into national education systems. And I'm therefore also happy to see that so many people, including speakers, are from the government. Uh, together with civil society organizations and other key stakeholders, we can make our dream uh, a reality. Let me thank you uh, all again. Specific thank you again to Rota for leading this initiative. And I'm looking forward to learn from the other speakers. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Roland, for that strong message. Now, questions are flying in from the audience. Um, the first question is to Manize. What do you do with the unreported abuses? Manize, can I hand it over to you? Could I hand the question again? What do you do with the unreported abuses? Um, well, we can't do much. We do get direct reported. Uh, we get direct um, calls also. 
uh, about cases which are not reported. And um, all our offices receive direct uh, case, you know, registration. They want a case done, but we cannot do it except for the awareness raising that we do. That is what we are trying very hard. And when we go into communities, we actually establish child protection networks so that they can and link them with local government so that they can report any cases that they may see happening in their villages. Perfect. I, I hope our audience is happy with that answer and I think it addressed perfectly. Now, uh, there's one for Rosie. What has been the impact of GCE being on girls specifically, Rosie? Uh, in our case, uh, girls have been, uh, pre uh, because of patriarchal structure, they have been victims of uh, various social cultural uh, issues. So because of this education, they have been able to raise their voice against this issue. For example, during menstruation, there is a there is a ritual that girls are segregated and not sent to schools. So they realized that this is uh, this is uh, not good. So they've been able to raise their voices. Just an example. Thank you. I hope I've answered your question. Definitely. Thank you, Rosie. Um, there's a long messages from uh, Suryadi from Indonesia and actually would like to give the floor to him since he's also our implementing partner in Indonesia as one of the locations of our project. Uh, Pak Suryadi, if you're here, we'd like to hear from you and please share with us your experience and uh, all the concerns you would like to raise. It's mute, uh, Yari. Thank you, Yari, and everyone. Um, uh, one topic that 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 we have in our program implementation is addressing on entrepreneurship, my enterprise, and and that. Uh, could help students to be more proactive, more creative, and they, they make their own products, for example, like uh, uh, handmade batik, uh, traditional wiping, plastic bag from reused plastics, where in this case, uh, they're not only learning about entrepreneurship, uh, produce, uh, producing product, but they're also taking care of their environments, uh, controlling the plastic waste. And especially for uh, youth, girl who are the victim of sex abuse, for example, uh, early marriage and early childbearing, etc. Uh, this kind of entrepreneurship activities could encourage their uh, self-esteem and, and self-confidence by doing, you know, uh, these entrepreneurship activities. And as as we learn from our previous. Uh, uh, schools that implemented uh, the program and through their Aflatin club, they, they create their own products. And we ask them that uh, it also helped them to, you know, uh, building their, their, their self-esteem and their self-confidence because they, they were the victim of sex abuse, for example. I just wondering if if we uh, could be Aflatones and everyone could help them to 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 link them to potential sponsor and most importantly to link them with wider market, for example international markets. I think if we could we could help them to link them with the wider markets, they 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 will more confidence. They will gain, you know, a uh, feeling of acceptance, not only from their own community, but wider community, let's say uh, international community. I think if this happens, they will be more proactive, more creative, more confident. And uh, I'm sure uh, if they can sell their products to the international uh, market, uh, they could uh, transform themselves from a victim to change maker. They can, you know, in, inspire other victims that they can do something uh, 
to change the conditions and they also can mitigate and stop unfair injustice, inequality, and everything that against their right to be empower youth. That is the question how we can do to link them to the international market. So we can help to help them to be more confident. Thank you, Yari. Thank you so much, Pastor Yadi. I think that's a very important message and question also. And it's a reminder that education doesn't stop there, that we need the ecosystem to link the youth to the next stage of their life. And I think this is a very good bridging for our next session, where we will dig further on the role of global citizenship education as the foundation for driving sustainable developments, also building peace. So I'm delighted to have uh, Mr. Khalid Al-Nama, the Family Policy Director from Doha International Family Institute, who will share with us his views on the intersections between GCED and Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Mr. Khalid, uh, over to you. I'm sorry, I think I wasn't muted. Uh, I would like to say uh, thank you very much for giving us this opportunity to be here with you today. Um, let me share with you my presentation, because I guess you are going to share the presentation. Yes, we are sharing your presentation with uh, yes, Mr. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to brief you a little bit about uh, Doha International Family Institute, where I came from. Actually, it's a global uh, policy advocacy institute established in 2006, uh, working to advance knowledge on Arab and families uh, and promote evidence-based policies here in local and regional uh, level. Uh, basically, we are uh, we work as a supply chain within the team. We have three main pillars, as you can see. We have a research department, policy department, and communication department. All of these departments work together for uh, aiming uh, to achieve um, uh, to achieve one uh, one goal, which actually advocate for new policies here in the region. Depends on the initiative are uh, actually taking care of within DFI itself. So, can we move ahead to the next slide, please? Yes. So uh, when we talk about the promotion of shared responsibility within the families, we can say across uh, the 2030 development agenda, implicit focus on the family has been uh, referred to the goals such as the, that, uh, the SDG number 5.4, uh, which actually state that promotion of shared responsibility within the household and family as a nationally appropriate. There is a huge or there is an importance implement uh, uh, family policies and programs that support families and provide cohesive support environment in which families can prosper. We usually promote uh, we usually uh, promote the shared responsibility within the families based on the societal needs, knowledge and evidence based policies and to advocate for evidence based policies here within the communities. Um, uh, what we do here, actually, we consider that one, the SDG number 5.4, it's our like blueprint uh, to promote gender uh, equalities and social welfare for the communities. We have taken to our consideration also in DFI a number of uh, initiatives to promote gender equality and family well-being from a social uh, perspective point of view by eliminating violence against women. And those actually came from um, uh, promoting a new policy here within Qatar and also by securing equal participation and opportunities for leadership and also raising the, raising the status of, uh, uh, of women uh, through the education, which I think this is the main uh, goal. We can go, uh, can we go ahead for the next slide, please? So when we talk about the importance of empowering young women through workforce uh, participation, we have conducted one uh, of the studies which has been recently published. That's uh, actually, uh, the study is actually com uh, comparative analysis of gender equality and social welfare in Qatar and Kuwait and Oman, which provide a conceptual and empirical analysis of gender gap and policies of social welfare and pay in Qatar, Kuwait and Oman, which we share the same uh, culture here in the region itself. 
Uh, however, there are uh, a number of remarkable progress, especially in education attainment, and yet those uh, uh, yet uh, such achievements were not matched by the equivalent level of participation in the labor market. However, those findings actually share a common uh, ground, uh, uh, basically. Um, uh, those, um, uh, those the empowering of young women uh, finding shows that the income stability is the most important element, uh, which will result in healthier families and break the cycle also of poverty, strengthen the economies, enhances the, enhances the socioeconomic participation of women in the labor market. Um, uh, we can go ahead also for the next slide. Well, actually, the main uh, initiative which currently being adopted here in Qatar, as you know, uh, that implementing the family uh, work uh, family uh, work family balance policies here in Doha, and that had been highly recognized recently in Qatar. And this is the way uh, the way where we can actually buffer the consequences of you know not having a fair or equal opportunities for women to participate in their uh, to participate in labor market. So what we are aiming here uh, by having a family friendly policies and and having flexible working arrangement policies actually to encourage them uh, to take their decisions and to stay in the lab, uh, to stay working uh, to stay working and manage their responsibilities within their home environment as we know here in Qatar most uh, likely most women they are highly educated and they have also obtained their uh, postgraduate degree and they are actually you know were capable to uh, carry on leadership position here in Qatar can we go ahead for the next slide please so uh, I think we can actually achieve this uh, goal by having a work family balance policies, especially it's uh, more or less, it's um, extended parental leave or child or offering child care facilities in the workplace, or even offering like a flexible working arrangement here in the, in, in the workplace. So I guess this is actually give us like a new um, atmosphere of having, uh, uh, having the uh, positive impact of implementing these policies. And these policies can be implemented through adapting new procedures or enforcing even the legislation here in Qatar by promoting gender equalities and women, women empowerment. And uh, finally, we can say something actually, uh, we do believe um, in our nation is the best served by diverse population coming together and high achievement comes only from equal rights. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, if you have any question, I'm ready actually to answer your question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Khalid. I'm sure there are a lot of questions that are going to come to you. But um, before that, uh, I'm pleased to invite Ms. Caroline Discombris, the ex Executive Director of the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative, who will share with us on the leadership role of young girls and women in peace and security, including challenges, lessons learned, and successes. Caroline, the floor is yours. Caroline, uh, you're still muted. Sorry, do you hear me now? We hear you now. Oh, sorry. Um, so I would like first to thank Aflatun International and our partner Education Above All uh, to invite the Whitaker Peace and Development Initiative to this webinar and to speak on the role of the leadership role of women and young girls in peace and security. Uh, this is a central concern for WPDI as we mainly operate in conflict and violence affected areas in Mexico, South Africa, as well as Uganda and South Sudan, two countries where we maintain youth empowerment programs in collaboration with education above all. In these environments, women face many gender specific challenges because they are often targeted by armed groups. Even if most uh, women are not directly exposed to such violence, all of them live in a climate of insecurity. Chronic conflict and violence also impact women by solidifying social and cultural norms that limit their capacities and prevent them from voices, voicing their needs and realizing their aspirations. In South Sudan, for example, where we worked since 2012, constant conflict has prevented progress. And today, one third of all girls are pregnant before 15. This calls for in-depth sensitization of both the leadership and the population. For example, WPDI recently launched a national campaign with UN Women and the government of the Netherlands on gender equality called Know Your Rights, Know Your Power, which reached a large audience and hopefully contributed to inform both women and men on women's rights and girls' rights. 
The problem here is that women are victims of violence and discrimination. Their communities also suffer. We witness this every day at WPDI, and UN Women stresses that women's participation increases the probability of a peace agreement lasting at least two years by 20%. So when women are involved in peace processes, there is greater emphasis on restorative justice and reconciliation. Women and young girls obviously are an asset for peace. This is a basic tenet of the Women, Peace and Security Agenda of the Security Council that is one of the main references of our action on the ground. Three years ago, to give you a concrete example, one of our young leaders in South Sudan, Nandegre Magdalena, broke the peace agreement between two tribes that had been fighting for nearly a decade. Local authorities and even the UN had made repeated efforts to broker peace, but it was her efforts that ultimately proved successful. And this agreement remains intact today. So empowering women is not just the right thing to do, it is a smart thing to do. At WPDI, we have learned to appreciate the transformative impact of having women and uh, young girls as key participants in peace programs. This led us to elevate gender equality as a strategic priority. Currently, women and girls represent nearly 50% of our beneficiaries and our trainings are gender sensitive to ensure that male beneficiaries can also be sensitized to gender equality. Education is of course, one of the most powerful tools to foster gender equality in the long term. Vocational trainings in particular are key to enhance, to enhance the employability of women, notably in places where many of them have not been to school at all or beyond primary. In many, in many places, uh, indeed, the law says that boys and girls have equal access to school, but in reality, girls will miss on school because they are told that education is not for them or because they are forced to marry or work early. As a result, um, women often lack tools and opportunities to become who they want to be. Our work is to provide them just that, educational tools and opportunities to uh, make a difference. But we have to admit in the meanwhile, it remains very challenging to, re to enroll young women from conflict places in humanitarian programs. When we started working in South Sudan, we partnered with UN Women so they could help us identify and recruit local young women. Since then, we have learned the importance of gaining trust from local community leaders. This takes time, but it is a wise investment. Many communities are willing to trust women when they achieve leadership position in peace building. Recently, to give you another example, one of our young leaders in Uganda, Joyce, beat two richer men in local election. She told us that she won because the community knew of her work with WPDI as a mediator who helped local leaders to address difficult cases of land disputes and domestic violence. As I conclude today, I would like you to remember this very inspiring example. Joyce's story shows us that by supporting women, to become leaders for peace in their communities, they can be trusted and even empowered to transform their societies from within. They may even rise to leadership roles, but whether this transformation is through political representation or remains more local, WPDI's efforts have clearly revealed that nurturing women in the past will ultimately generate positive cycle of progress and development, both for women and for the society at large. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, for those powerful messages. Now, uh, let's open up the floor for discussion. Uh, I see a question for uh, Khalid. Khalid, why are the achievements not equivalent to participation in the labor market? Has there been a research on what the reason is, uh, especially from the women's point of view? Well, actually, this is a very tough question, to be honest. Uh, we haven't conducted uh, any research so far to understand why. The, what's the reason behind uh, having this, uh, let's say, this dilemma here in, in the region itself. But I think there are a couple of reasons which make, uh, which give us like a sense of not being able to participate fully in the labor market by having increasing the uh, commitment of the family itself. And I think the pandemic also uh, provide us another aspects uh, by having what we call it like a hybrid uh, educational program, which required an immediate supervision from the families. So I guess this one is actually empire women from uh, being fully engaged in the labor market and to choose whether to be part of, uh, you know, having uh, a leadership role there in the market or to stay with their families at home. But I think, you know, by having or by implementing also family-friendly policies, this is will 
uh, empower women actually to stay, to save their um, jobs, and also to continue nurturing, nurturing their uh, kids as well. But as of now, we don't have actually a concrete or a scientific evidence to show us the exact reason why uh, we have this uh, issue so far in the region itself, but it's required actually further investigation. I like that our audience uh, is challenging us with this tough question. <laughs> Uh, but uh, Khalid, has the proposed intervention uh, to increase uh, women participation in the labor market work? Well, I think so. It's worked uh, to some extent, of course, because this is going to encourage them also to stay in the labor market. And also adding to our, uh, you know, if, we, if we're going to uh, actually acknowledge their concern, whether if they have like incentive to stay in the labor market, of course, they will continue uh, providing uh, their services and also they will protect their family unit as well. But I think it, we require, we do require actually to provide a couple of incentive in terms of uh, providing like policies. We call them family friendly policies by having like a kind of uh, adaptation or a remote uh, by adaptation of the current, uh, what they call it, um, a commute, we, we, we have something, we call it a commuting project. We have adapted recently, so we encourage them to pick up their kids from the schools. We offer them a kind of uh, flexible working arrangement. So all of this stuff or all of these tactics actually will help them to stay in the labor market. Great, thank you, Khalid. Caroline, would you like to add anything, albeit in a different area, perhaps uh, what other challenges um, for us to increase like uh, girls and women participation in the peace uh, area as well? Well, I think it's the same. I mean, on our side, what we do is that to ensure women are part of our programs, as we said, we always try to build trust with the communities because this is an essential part for, for them to, uh, to understand that what we are going to, uh, to do with the girls and the women is just to uh, capacity building and give them a platform to raise their voices. So from day one, everything starts with contextualization and working closely with the communities to ensure that they will let the women and girls to join our programs, to be trained, to become like role models and leaders in their communities. And we also make sure that we always like um, select the young girls like in pair with one male, one female. So they work jointly together. It's also a way to virtual the, the families. And also it's to learn also like to teach the, the male, like the, the young boys, like to, to understand that they have to accept um, and to work together with the girls and to give space for their leadership roles as well. So this is how we work also in, uh, in conflict affected areas to ensure like uh, the women have a platform and we also create safe space and, and contextualize program and especially targeting only women. This is what we do with UN Women. Uh, when we train the women all together uh, for, for several time, we include also literacy programs uh, into what we do to also um, welcome all the girls to be able to access like uh, peace building activities and training. Amazing, thank you so much, Caroline. Now, speaking of girls and women, let's actually hear from them. We have a short video here on voices around the globe. Um, it will be nice to hear from them before we enter the next uh, discussion session. Let's, let's play the video. Hello friends. Hi. I'm nine years old. Nice to meet you. Thank you. During pandemic in a Latin classic, my friends and I doing gardening like flower and vegetables. Thank you. 
schools were closed and we studied at home but it's not like studying in school because the lessons were a little bit hard to study by ourselves and yeah we also missed our platoon activities a lot i'm really sad about that um, and we didn't meet our friends for months uh, we didn't go for shopping and there are some of us negative impacts since the pandemic has started um it causes a lot of problems to everyone especially for us to use that we are most learning by zooming so what really upset me about during the pandemic is that school, school being closed because since that the school is being closed the learning process was made through online and i think with with the country we live in the philippines i think we are we aren't ready for that to happen since nga, since the internet connection here is very slow and we some of the pupils or the students aren't keeping keeping up to that system because of the gadgets the internet connection and i think the learning process was um was very difficult and all all the thing of the student is about passing the requirements rather than the learning the learning the knowledge of it and find comfort with my peers with my classmates and I consider them as my support system. Uh, without them, I feel so lonely in our in our house, in our home. Um, because during this uh, online modality, I chose the online modality for the school year. I find it so difficult. It feels like I'm just complying, complying for the sake na, for the sake of passing the school works without without considering the things that um, um, the thing that I must learn from this from this school year um, what I also miss during this uh, lockdown is that the meetings that we have before the lockdown with our co-officers um, in youth lab of Tagum Cooperative so since the pandemic has started, um, it, it caused a lot of negative effects. But despite that, it also um, it also has its advantages. But by staying at home, we could share a lot more time in the family. So we could utilize that time to bond with each other much closer than the before. However, looking at it now, I would say that this pandemic is not an easy fight. As, and it is not only a fight within us, but it is also to all people throughout the globe. As we see the pandemic in different perspectives, in different countries, everything would only tend to end with one thought, that if we work together, we fight this pandemic as one, we can indeed heal as one. That's all. Thank you, Juliet, for playing that video. I love it. Uh, Caroline, it seems like a lot of people still want to hear from you, but uh, since we still have um, more speakers to go and we're running uh, behind time, so uh, let's, uh, Caroline, if you want to address the questions on the chat box direct directly, please feel free. But for now, um, let's hear from Mr. Hong Rexme, uh, Country Director for Action Aid Cambodia who will speak in details on the role of girls and young women in climate change. Uh, sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks a lot for having me. Um, let me share the screen. Yes, I hope you can see it. Um, so um, I'm here from Cambodia. I think different from other people in the room. Um, and hope uh, we, can, we can get uh, some partnership uh, together in Cambodia um, in, in the coming uh, months or years. Yeah. So I'm, I'm here to share um, like four or five experience on uh, how, what ActionAid is doing uh, around the globe and especially in Cambodia. So um, just to give you a, a bit of context, I'm not going to read through this because of time, but uh, just for your information, Cambodia, half of our populations live under um, 2.5 US dollar per, per day. So you can imagine how much a cup of coffee means to half of our population. Um, the online uh, thing was not the solution during the pandemic because only 41% 40, of our young people have access to the internet. 
um, and that, that doesn't count um, children younger than 15. So um, it's really an issue for us. Um, Action Aids uh, is a global uh, federation and we work on climate change. We see it as a, as a, a major challenge because the world we live in um, are living in a systems that make us, um, uh, that created problem for us, that jeopardize our sustainable futures. It is, it is for our generation and also for the next generations. Um, so uh, it is a global issues. We need global solutions and young people are like kind of promising uh, resources to, to tackle those change. Um, as a right-based human rights organizations, um, we stand on four pillars to um, develop or to build resilience, um, especially with uh, women and young people. Um, so the, the first pillar being um, is to consent, consensitize, uh, consensitize uh, human rights and access to public service um, for people and vulnerable groups. Um, this is one of our overall approach. Uh, tell them, teach them, train them, raising awareness um, about their rights and the, the, the basic needs they're supposed to receive. Secondly, um, we raise awareness and build their knowledge and skills uh, needed uh, in their respective communities. As one of our speakers said, um, local knowledge, local capacities are the, the core of the, the response of the action. Um, thirdly, we develop collective actions or solidarities. Um, one voice cannot make any change, cannot make anyone hurt. Uh, but a lot of voice together speak at once, speak at one platform in partnerships, they can be heard louder. And lastly, is uh, strengthen institution and uh, influence policies through partnership with uh, UT bureaus and policy, uh, and we do policy advocacy. Um, UT bureaus, I mean the government and also some private corporates who kind of run the world or who control the economies. I have uh, four specific examples that we are doing. Um, we have a lot of uh, kind of approach, uh, one of which is um, uh, promoting leadership of young uh, people and women in humanitarian actions. So we stand on three pillars. Um, the first one is to um, target women and young people and promote their leadership in the humanitarian actions. Uh, secondly, we try to shift work with women uh, and, and the youth agents to shift power to the affected communities. Um, it's their rights were affected. Uh, it's their livelihood were affected. Duty Bureau has the responsibility to respect, to listen to them and also engage them. And lastly, um, it, uh, we try to promote accountability in, uh, for the, of the humanitarian assistance. So th this is one example. And um, if you uh, tried, if you interested, uh, you can read more on uh, Shifting power to young people. If you Google shifting power to young people, action aid, and you can find this too. Um, secondly, um, we promote um, leadership of women in disaster risk reduction and climate change um, uh, through three approach. Um, so it's very similar: building people's rights, uh, I mean, uh, empowering them. Uh, establish a platform for them to participate and, and establish a platform for them to influence policy. This is our core overarching approach. So you see here, um, the first one is um, we build capacity for them, for the women to be, in, uh, to be in evident informed advocates. We turn young people, you see the, the, the three women, they are young women, including Muslim women, um, they become young advocates in their respective communities. Um, and we work with them to develop women charter of demands as a, a, a evidence for them to speak to um, their local authorities to engage in planning and budgeting decisions. So in, in Cambodia, we have two process of budgeting. One is at the national level, um, by the assembly, by the budget law, and, the, and secondly, is at the commune level um, by local planning process. So this is where women can sit with commune councillors and discuss the budget and the prioritization of the budget allocations. And thirdly, um, in the middle, uh, we facilitate policy dialogue and collective influence through women champion networks. These three women, are, we call them women champions. 
Um, this uh, approach, we also uh, collaborate with UN Women in Cambodia and UN Environment uh, in the region to uh, promote uh, this practice and expand some uh, to other, uh, some new locations as well. Um, the third example is around uh, land tenure security and gender responsive public services. Um, um, a lot of uh, our work in this area are sensitive because a lot of land grabbers are powerful people, um, have their politically, political allied with political parties, or they could be member of the Senate or so. Um, so it is very sensitive, but uh, we work with young people and we, we have to be very mindful uh, that they are safe, they are uh, secure um, in dealing with us. Um, so um, one of our approach is to build their capacity to be a citizen journalist. Um, so it is the uh, using the advantage of uh, social media and turn that into opportunity for them to, to learn to share, to voice uh, their needs. Um, and some of them were selected as uh, community-based human rights defenders. Uh, it's really up to the case. Um, if they are victims of, if their communities are victim of uh, rights violations or land conflicts, um, we work, we, we use the human rights defenders approach. Um, if they are just um, um, need to improve the public service, we uh, use citizen journalist approach. And in some location, we use both approach together uh, with, with uh, the young people agents. Secondly, facilitate platforms and uh, to with with the with the companies with the governments to find alternative resolutions to resolve the issues. And lastly, again, um, policy dialogue and, and influence policies with multi-stakeholder. And my last example is around education. So we work with schools. Um, in building their resilient and local life skills. We have a tool we call Promoting Rights in Schools, um, but it is like everything with the education. So it's too much for us. So it, we, instead of focusing too much, we just focus on one thing, which is resilient and local life skills, teaching and learning. So we teach teachers, we train teachers, um, so that they have new methodology. By new, I mean it's old, but new for them. Um, how to be student-centered and, and teaching participate uh, to re-approach to students. Um, uh, the second is to support students so that they can learn life skills, uh, local life skills. And again, by local, I mean um, any life skill that relates to the livelihoods of their parents and communities. It could be forestry, fisheries, um, and agriculture. We are not talking about vocational training with young uh, children here. And uh, lastly, uh, is to promote uh, school management and accountability. Yep, um, these are my four approach. And um, like Caroline mentions, I, I can witness that if we invest in building women's leadership, we will create a lot of ripple effects uh, than investing to everyone. Um, and if you have very little resources, um, just focusing on women. Um, you do it at communities, they will make influence at the community level. You do it at the national level, they can make influence at national level and so forth. So thank you for your attention and thanks again for the opportunities. I learned a lot from this event. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Raxme. We equally also learned a lot from your presentation, which is very interesting. Uh, now I'm excited to hear the insights from Dr. Logan Cochrane, uh, Associate Professor at Hamad bin Khalifa University on advancing marginalized girls and women as key players for sustainable development. Uh, Dr. Logan, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I think there's a light above me, but hopefully you can see me well. I'm going to try and be brief, and I'm going to uh, make four points on the role of research in supporting and advancing and strengthening the work that everyone's been speaking about today. And it really reiterates a lot of the things that we've heard from the earlier sessions and, and from this uh, session as well, but maybe just from a research perspective, uh, us sitting here at the university. So the first point is on localization. And we've heard about uh, localization in different forms in different ways, but with uh, global education or global citizenship education or SDG education, uh, whichever way we're framing it, uh, it's great that we, we work together and we learn together about what's working best and what's effective and what the global issues are. Uh, but we also can recognize what local priorities, what local values and what local issues should really shape and motivate and be prioritized 
within uh, specific schools and for particular age groups and particular countries. And this leads to the second point that I make, which is learning from best practice, but uh, working towards best fit, that we align our different issues, priorities, and values uh, within this global context, whether it's in the SDG framework or a national framework, whatever it may be. Uh, but we work towards a, a localized best fit type of approach. Uh, not only will this align with the priorities and interests of students, but it really addresses those local issues and uh, may avoid some of the challenges that are encountered if we adopt best practices from somewhere else and feel imposed in another place. Like one of our earlier speakers, I've also worked in South Sudan and we see some of the challenges of imported curriculum and uh, some of the ways in which there's a mismatch between the skills that are being taught or the emphasis that's being placed on certain areas and then the lives that people are, are living. And so we need to ensure that there is alignment in this, in this process of ensuring best fit over best practice. And the third point, which I think everyone's been speaking about today, but to reiterate, and maybe the role that research plays in, in strengthening all these processes of localization and finding best fit is better understanding positionality, uh, the way people live in society, the way that they're unequal or have privileges that others don't in society, looking at gender in a, in a very complex constellation of things that we experience, rural, urban, abilities that differ, uh, class that differs, histories that differ, and many ways that, that we uh, experience our lives differently, that if we better understand the, the positionality that everyone has that we're trying to engage with in a particular school, but also in, with particular students, we can better tailor and cater what we're doing to be more effective uh, and also be more attuned to the different challenges people take. And this maybe is, is, is most relevant if we're developing national curricula. So we might develop a national curricula, but is it taking into the different contexts of, of rural communities versus urban communities or peri-urban communities or very remote communities? And those sorts of uh, things where we can look at the different uh, accessibility components of, of what we're uh, building into our curriculum. And research, of course, is critical for all of these. Localization requires us to know what the issues, priorities, and values are uh, at all the different levels, at all the different age groups. Best Moving from best practice and learning from best practice into best fit also requires research and effective learning mechanisms so that we can understand what's resonating and what's not resonating and why and how we can adjust what we're doing to make it more effective. And through this, I think I'll advocate an approach to research that's maybe different. A lot of the research that we do at the university is often expert driven or top down where uh, someone, a professor or researcher based at, at a research institute develops a research question. I think we should try to, as best we can, enable alternatives to research, which is uh, either participatory in nature or what we could call knowledge co-production, where communities, teachers, principals, parents, students themselves have opportunities to engage themselves to help us better know and better understand these three points that I made earlier about localization, about best fit over best practice, and about better understanding the diverse experiences people have so that our engagement can be uh, the most effective. And hopefully I stayed under my five minutes. I'm happy to answer any questions or give some specific examples of how uh, the research process can enable and strengthen uh, the work that we're all doing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Logan. Uh, love the three points, comprehensive, clear, uh, and on point. Um, before we discuss, uh, let's have our last but not least uh, speaker from Qatar Fund for Development, Ms. Moza Al-Ishak, uh, Strategic Partnership Officers, uh, who will elaborate more on how we mobilize resources for girls' empowerment. Uh, Ms. Ishak, please, over to you. Hello, uh, my name is Moza al ishak from Qatar Fund for Development. I would like to thank Education Above All, Afflaton International, International, and Rota for organizing this event, and I thank all the different speakers that have um, given us wonderful insights today around the subject. Allow me to share my screen, please. I'll take you through this quick presentation, which will basically um, talk about the role that Qatar Fund for Development um, has towards education in general, and specifically towards gender-sensitive gender global citizenship and life skills education for youth. Um, the focus of Qatar Fund for Development is systematic. We focus on education, strengthening education systems, 
uh, resilience, um, giving um, innovations, innovative solutions to global education challenges through research and development policy policy interface with partners such as, um, you know, uh, Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, Hamad bin Khalifa Universities, and we have colleagues from those um, institutions who have spoken today, um, alongside, of course, improving learning outcomes, um, supporting graduate and postgraduate opportunities in youth, specifically and especially from developing countries um, and, and those that are uh, in crisis supporting the role of non-state educational providers and, and partnering with them. So we look at all the different sectors that we could work with to um, strengthen education systems and provide access to quality education. We Ms. Utilize... Ms. I'm really sorry to cut you, but uh, could you please put your presentation on presentation mode so that we all can see? Yes, perfect. Thank you so okay. much. Um, so we also utilize technology for education wherever we uh, find that useful. Um, we've all seen the impact that uh, technology has um, with, with COVID. So we're definitely uh, supportive of, of that. And um, last but not least, uh, our approach is very cross-sectoral. So we link a lot of different uh, initiatives or, or let's say areas alongside our, our education initiatives. And I'll, I'll go into more detail in the coming slides. This is a brief of what I just mentioned. So our focus is um, to provide access and inclusion to quality education for children, but not, not really just children. It's just more on, you know, we look at with our partners, the, the, the full cycle of, of students or age groups from primary education with our partner education above all, to uh, university level and higher education through the Qatar Scholarships Program, which I'm gonna come to uh, in a while. So we also provide uh, inclusive quality education and training opportunities, uh, which, which um, in increases life skills and uh, better equip um, global citizenship with, with our target audiences. And, and everything we do as a development agency representing the state of Qatar, this is what we look for in, in the partnerships that we create in, in the sector of education is to find out how we can support the students to understand that they are part of a, they're part of a local community that is in touch with a wider global community um, with obviously in a time where we, we live in global challenges, people need to be aware of, of what they can do or students specifically. So we focus on that. Um, and that basically touches on, you know, strengthening resilience, um, you know, uh, and providing students with um, uh, projects and curriculum that talks about climate change, uh, climate action, sustainable development and whatnot. Last but not least, we also uh, look at um, supporting um, more scalable, let's say, or capacity building um, initiatives to, for instance, supporting the teaching force. Um, we have a lot of initiatives with education above all on that front, um, especially on in, in, in Syria, Turkey, and, and whatnot to support refugees and to support the capacity of um, institutional capacity where we provide uh, more teachers on, on the ground. Skip, I'll skip this um, slide to go to this one. So part of you know, um, you know, the subject is gender, gender um, girls education, basically. And this is an example of uh, Qatar Fund for Development's uh, contributions. We, um, during the Paris Peace Summit in 2018, there was a pledge by, um, you know, or basically there was a, an initiative by the G7 countries, which is the uh, Sharlva De Declaration on Quality Education for Girls and His Highness Sheikh Tamim, Ben Hamad Al Thani, um, the Emir of the State of Qatar, pledged to provide access to, of quality education for one million girls by 2021. And I'm pleased to say that by December 2020, we have reached this goal. So this is something that um, we here at Qatar Fund for Development are involved in. The countries, as you can see on the on screen, um, cover um, different continents and and you know and, and partners and and that. That is very diverse. And uh, last but not least, uh, we have an initiative called Qatar Scholarships. Now with Qatar Scholarships, um, it's, uh, it's a program focused on uh, higher education, 
The main current partners that we have is Doha Institute for Graduate Studies, Hamad Bin Khalifa University, Qatar University, and Lucille. But it's very worth noting that um, the kind of, I would like to kind of shortly mention the background behind Qatar scholarships. Now, the state of Qatar has been funding many, many uh, different um, higher education scholarships, both inbound in Qatar and mostly um, beyond beyond the state. Uh, and and it's very worth noting that our focus mainly goes to students in crisis and, and students in conflict. Um, and uh, again, to mention, you know, to go back to the cross-sectional, cross-sectoral, sorry, um, point, uh, those students, in addition to re receiving a scholarship, receive um, psychosocial support, um, life skill courses, and you know, some programs even have economic empowerment options where uh, some families are supported or, you know, um, job placement opportunities happen, et cetera. So our approach is very holistic. And as you can see that, of course, our main partner for the outbound um, initiatives is um, education above all. With Qatar scholarships, um, the idea was to create an umbrella where we would bring all these initiatives under one, let's say, um, uh, roof or, or um, uh, oversight and, uh, and to encourage students from developing countries to, to come to Qatar and make use of the, um, the educational uh, um, ecosystem that has been built in the country. And that, that, that saying that uh, the point is that um, providing scholarships to the students from developing countries has not been something new to Qatar, but through Qatar Fund for Development and through the initiative of Qatar scholarships, we're accelerating this, um, uh, these activities and trying to reach as much students as possible from developing countries, increasing their global citizenship um, and providing them beyond, you know, with, with, with uh, services beyond the scholarship with you know, life skill courses, things that will increase their understanding of uh, global challenges and how to become a better global citizen. And lastly, but not, um, you know, I'd like to mention that since we started, this initiative started in 2018, about three, three years ago, we have around 400 students with a 50% uh, to 50% ratio of female to male, um, just to touch upon the female, um, you know, um, point here. Um, and we are very pleased with that. We are very um, cautious not to, uh, we'll, we'll actually, it's, it's very important to us that we um, maintain this ratio of, of, uh, of, of gender in our programs. And that's it from our, our side. I know I'm the last one. I don't want to take a lot, a lot of time on, you know, with, from everyone. And I hope this has been a good um, session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Ishak, um, for sharing with us your excellent initiatives. Now, questions are flying in. We're running over time, but it's always good to see that everyone is so engaged. For Mr. Raksme and Ms. Moza, working on one-to-one -one with individual schools through organizations have seen a great positive impact, but to implement the same programs nationally through national curriculum is very challenging. How have you been coping with this? Perhaps I give to Mr. Raksmi first. Yes, um, good questions. Uh, we partner with the uh, Ministry of Education. You know, it takes months to come up with a partnership agreement with the ministries, uh, but they have uh, been in relationship for like um, a decade. So it's, it's, it's just get to some paperwork and then we have a team of uh, the ministry and a team of academic staff to do the training with schools. And um, our local partners, local and your partners work at the, the local level. They have good partnership with um, the, the teachers and, and, and district office of education. So this is uh, very easy in collaborating. And uh, one of the clue is to have good relationship and working with the school management. This is the, the, the real clue to to be engaging. Um, and the national curriculum has been developed by the ministry, so we just adopt it. We just take new and progressive um, approach and, and actions to, 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 to each schools we target. Um, so nothing is like brand new to the schools. We just make sure the policies, the guidelines will be delivered at schools. I hope that clarifies the question. 
Thank you, Raksmi. Uh, Ms. Ishak, would you like to add? Yes, um, we don't implement and uh, we rely on trusted partners with proven expertise in the field of education, such as UNICEF and of, um, education of all. Uh, but on a national level, I mentioned that, um, you know, we, we can consistently look at uh, policy uh, review and systems approach in, in our programs. So I hope that answers the question. Perhaps I want to also hear from Dr. Logan on this, uh, on systems change and yeah, how to engage academia. Dr. Logan. Sure, maybe I can give an example connected to my points on localization and local priorities is some of the activities that we're engaged with here in the state of Paltar is looking at local values, local traditions, alignment with the national vision, alignment with SDGs. And through this, somewhat different than our previous panelists are speaking about it, more, more uh, administrative issues. But I think from a content perspective, we have an opportunity to look at alignment that, that creates synergies and synergies that, that empower students to embrace their own traditions, histories, languages. And uh, through this process, uh, a more participatory one that I think you know, we, we can result and we're still working on this project, but uh, one that, that really resonates with students and takes global education from being a, a topic that, that you have to do because you sit in class, but to one they get really passionate about and themselves take on, bring forward and become leaders of change. Um, I, so if there's any other further questions, I can expand on that work. Thank you so much, Dr. Logan. I think all of our speakers today have shared excellent points. I'm sure our audience agree. Uh, unfortunately, we have come to an end. All good things must come to an end. But I'm really delighted to have Ms. Mehnas Akbar Aziz, Member National Assembly of Pakistan, Convener Special Parliamentary Committee on Child Rights, who, are, who is here with us today to share with us her closing remarks to close our discussion. Ms. Aziz, over to you, please. Uh, hello, assalamu alaikum, good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, well, the, the conversation and the presentations have been fascinating. And thank you so much, Aflatoon, for uh, bringing all of these experiences together. For me, as an educationist, um, it has been, um, you know, a whole journey of revisiting the past uh, 20 years where I have been uh, diving into some of uh, the ways and methodologies that you are uh, now employing and much better. Uh, you know, I see research institutions, I see uh, a lot of uh, different kind of approaches which we did not know about a couple of years back. Uh, so I'm seeing a very good um, and very conducive coalition of uh, Indonesia, Nepal, Pakistan, Ivory Coast, uh, Mozambique and Zimbabwe coming together. And I wish to see more countries coming together also. Uh, I will give you an example that I am uh, the uh, Asia representative for International Parliamentary Education Network. And we find it very, very difficult, uh, very, very, uh, 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 what would you say, conducive uh, to be uh, working at a regional level and to um, uh, understand the dynamics and uh, provide solutions. From what I hear today and what I see is that you have created models and these models can now be replicated to other countries. It's, it's a coalition of models. So it's not like you choose one model, but all of you have such synergy and you provide one solution. So it's all of you put together, providing that one solution. So it's been fascinating for me. And when Munize Banu from Sahil, Pakistan, approached me to come for this uh, uh, webinar um, and asked me to stay this one hour, and I said, yes, because I want to hear out the champions. I want to hear 
the real work that is going on because this is the work that informs us parliamentarians as well. Now, uh, not to mention that Pakistan has a lot of challenges besides being in a, in a very difficult neighborhood situation with what is going on in Afghanistan, which is, uh, um, you know, heartbreaking. Uh, what, what's happening with the girls and what's happening with the boys even with poverty and lack of, uh, 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 you know, these opportunities. But uh, here what we see, uh, like in many other uh, poorer countries, um, and uh, so what we see in Pakistan is this, um, that, uh, you know, the, the opportunities are preferred for the boys and less for the girls. But what we see also is that girls are more resilient and more stronger. And whenever they can find a way, they excel. So the girls who are going to schools are uh, always get the best positions in schools. Uh, but despite the fact that there are huge issues like internet connectivity to the most marginalized um, and uh, gender, especially what, what's very worrying for me, uh, that I'm seeing a change in my lifetime, that we are becoming very regressive. The space is decreasing for girls and women. Uh, I'm one of the nine elected members in our National Assembly of almost 380 members. And uh, so the fight is not just for issues, but the fight is also for that space for women and to be recognized as equal um, uh, you know, e equal um, uh, members, uh, equal professionals and equal uh, people uh, who are representing their constituencies. So I would like to, um, uh, you, you know, suggest a few things. Um, I'm delighted, first of all, as I said before. I mean, and it's just, it's just so near and dear to me, my heart um, uh, to provide life skills to, uh, for global citizenship for youth. Uh, that global sense and that global citizenship is very important because if in these times, although we are in the 21st century, but these times are such that we are becoming more isolated and inward looking into our own countries and into our own communities. So this link is uh, very refreshing. And I'm very pleased that Sahil is doing uh, some work in Pakistan. But what I would like to see, as I said before, is, and I would like to suggest uh, that uh, to form a coalition uh, of this model. This model is the coalition. It's not one, um, one uh, uh, you know, individual or one institution, but all these countries, it's, it's just beautiful. And also to um, pull in parliamentarians, also to pull in parliamentarians so that they are sensitized and, they, and young groups, youth groups, for uh, not just life skills, but also for uh, uh, professional skills and for, uh, um, it's for participating in politics, for uh, participating actively, I've read uh, in your uh, slides, for participating actively um, in advocacy of matters and being responsible. I think it was uh, Cambodia that were mentioning, you know, all these, uh, what they do with the budgets and everything. So that's fascinating because we do not allow our girls, we do not allow them to go that way. So um, I'm sure you will be able to pull together an agenda for countries like ours, Pakistan and other countries as well. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's, it's a win-win that we have um, uh, a face a coalition and the face of so many countries and very diverse countries, small, big, different, um, uh, very different realities coming together uh, for youth. Because uh, in our country, we have 50% of our population, which is a very huge population is youth. Uh, and right now we are failing our youth. Uh, so, so when we do interventions like yours, uh, these are very helpful. So in the end, I would like to say thank you once again. Um, and I'm working very closely with Sahil.
my uh, uh, my committee on child rights is working very closely with sahil and i would i've already asked her to come into the parliament and brief us parliamentarians and if we can have a model especially for the parliamentarians to take to their constituencies to work on this and we have also a youth forum in the parliament and hope to see you all in pakistan soon thank you very much and best of luck Thank you very much, Ms. Aziz. You have perfectly captured our spirits in carrying out our efforts so far and our direction moving forward. We're really happy to have you here. Um, before we say goodbye, uh, let me welcome Mr. Abdullah Abdullah as Acting Executive Director of ROTA, who will close our event today. Mr. Abdullah, please. Yes, assalamu alaikum. Uh, greeting everyone. Uh, on behalf of Reach Out to Asia program of education, above all, we would like to thank you all for your valuable contribution. Uh, this contribution really uh, enriched the discussion and, and really reassure uh, us that we are doing here really the thing which is as a priority to the positioning the girls' empowerment through global citizenship on, on the top of our uh, agendas. Um, it was very insightful uh, webinar contributions from everyone. Thank you very much for your really uh, joining us and your commitment and hope to see you soon again in the different webinars. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Abdullah. And thank you very much everyone for your time today. Uh, we'll see you at our next webinar. Thank you and have a good day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you and laugh is goodbye. Thank you very much.